Good morning. Good morning. It's looking to me like we're going to have to sing real loud today because I think we're missing a few people. So don't care how bad it is, just sing loud. It's a joyful noise to the Lord. I ask you to please fill out the register and pass it back. A couple of things going on this week. Tuesday evening is Women's Circle. Does the Tuesday evening Women's Circle lady want to say anything about it? Surely. No, we're do prayer, blankets, so. prayer blankets on Tuesday evening. So come and, and uh, help do that. Also, uh, teen Bible study. Wednesday evening is adult Bible study, and that's about it for this week. Keep in mind annual business meeting next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday, on the 17th. Only birthday this week, Don, is Kai Brewer on the 13th. You got his number? I think he's in Colorado Springs somewhere nowadays. Okay. <laughs> let's turn in our bulletin and let's read the uh, call to worship together. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Someone's already singing. Oh, oh I thought that was Dave. Anyway, uh, no, it's great you're here. Sorry, Dave. Uh, it's great you're here. Hey, uh, it's going to be, this is, I think today is warmer than, uh, it's like it's as warm as it's going to be all week. It's going to, Arctic air is coming in and all that good stuff, snow again tomorrow and Tuesday. So that's okay. We're here now. So we are going to start singing. We're going to do that first off. We're going to sing hymn number one, uh, 505 in your hymnal. So if you will stand with, sing, uh, with, sing with me, love lifted me. So. Deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep the stain within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. prayer. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for that love that we can depend on to lift us in hard times, in good times, that you're just always there for us, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for the blessings that you give us. Bless each and every one of us today as we gather together to fellowship, to hear your word, and just to be together and, and to share in communion later on, Lord. Just be a blessing to each of us. We pray this in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Sound great. There's more out there, more out there than I thought. It sounded great singing. In my heart there rings a melody, and that's a good old song. I used to have to. I, used to say, I had to say it with my grandma. She'd be playing the piano, and but now that's okay. I'll do that again anytime. In my heart there rings a melody. Remain seated. That Jesus gave me, it was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody, tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know is here to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love it will be my endless theme in glory with the angels I will sing to be a song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven reign in my heart there rings a melody there rings a melody with heaven's harmony in Stone or prayer? That's you. You coming up? Huh? I am thine, O oh Lord. Yep. Oh. <laughs> I was so caught up in that last song that I, I lost it. Dan, you coming up? What threw me off was you was singing that one, not reading the words or anything. You were singing that. It threw me off. I am thine, O oh Lord, and thank goodness, huh? Okay, we'll sing that one then. That's yeah, yeah that's right. Good, I know this one, so that's how gonna help. I am thine, O oh Lord, I have heard thy voice and told thy love to me. God, I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed. 
blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before Thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious blessed time. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding sign. Across the narrow sea, there are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with Thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. To thy precious bleeding side. Amen. Now we're going. Amen. <laughs> All right, that live TV is tough. <laughs> it is tough. Uh, well, thank you for helping open us up this morning, Lee and Gary and Marie, too, for playing. It's good to, to worship together. Nobody gets everything right all the time. Even me, especially me. You almost got me coming up here after that other song. Yeah, you were coming. I was. It's like, Gary, Gary says it's time, so okay. <laughs> but it's good to be with you and singing praises to God. They're, you know, the words are really, really profound if you think about them. I guess that's what I was doing. I was thinking and praying as I was singing. It's a good thing to be doing. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer now, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have the privilege and the pleasure to come together like this, to sing praises to your name, to worship you, and, and Lord, to love one another. None of us are perfect, and yet you still love all of us, and you've taught us to love one another. Thank you for the fellowship that we have together, the encouragement that we can give to one another. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit works in and through us to accomplish your purposes. We also thank you, Lord, for the moisture we've been getting these days around here. It's well, well needed, much needed, and we appreciate it. We don't always like the mud, but we do like the moisture because we need it. Thank you for your graciousness to us and your good timing as we continue to trust you. We also trust to you the good of our nation and our leaders we ask that you would work in and through them, that you would bring justice and truth out, and that there would be fairness, that all would be treated with dignity. And especially, Lord, that your gospel may go out into all the land, that people would be revived and come to you, and into all the world, too. We see things going on around the world, and we think, well, these must certainly be terrible days, maybe the last days of this earth. And yet, You've told us there will be great revival, too. So we ask for this. We ask for the reviving of your church around the world. May we rise up strong in Jesus Christ. Lord, we bring to you the requests in our bulletin. Pray that you'd be with Helen, Lee Ray's sister, who's now been moved to hospice. She's 98, Lord, and she's had a lot of good years. We pray that you would bless the days and weeks and whatever time is ahead of her that they would be good times, and that you would take her to yourself in peace. Thank you for Shirley and helping her with her illness. We pray that she'd continue to get better. Shirley Stout and the things that they've been going through, we pray for your encouragement on Shirley and George and also Lucretia. And Pam, this friend of Vern with pancreatic cancer that's spread really badly, pray for her that you would bring healing and draw her nearer to yourself. 
Charles and Susan encourage them in these days. And Matt, Paula's daughter-in-law's brother-in-law, Pat, Paula's daughter's brother-in-law, that he's stabilized out of ICU now and doing better. And Janice, Chris's friend, encourage her and strengthen her. And Jasper, Cinnamon's brother, we ask for encouragement and direction in his life and is getting connected with people who will encourage him in his faith and help him to grow. And Sue Christensen and her recovery from hip replacement and healing of her femur and the other things that are going on in her body now. Bless her. And Lisa, continue to help her in her work in the Omega House in Bueller and the Omega Project and the ministry that they perform in our area for so many people. Lord, they're where the rubber meets the road. We pray that you would protect them and meet all of their needs. And Vern, as he deals with the cancer and the severe back pain. And Gloria, as she needs your strength and encouragement in these days. And Jerry, continue healing there. And Karen and her request. And Shanna, this friend of Diana's who's going through cancer treatment, may she continue to do well. And Jerry, Chris's sister. And Lord, thank you for being with us in this last week. Thank you that uh, Mark's surgery went well, that he continued to heal. Um, and others among us, Lord, you know what is going on in our lives more than any other people know. And so we lift before you now our unspoken requests. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering. Amen. It's interesting how uh, God does things. He sent our next hymn along, I think, specifically for me, Open My Eyes That I May See, as a, person, as a little reminder to pay attention to what I'm doing. 381 in the hymnal, and May Seated will sing that one together. So. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me Place in my hands the wonderful key That will unclasp and set me free Silently now I wait for thee Ready, my God, thy will to see Open my eyes, illumine me Spirit divine Open my ears that I may hear Voices of truth thou sendest clear, and while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything falls will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Time to worship the Lord in giving, and the passage that I'd like to call your attention to today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, and this is a passage that um, there was a time not too long ago when Jill and I were really wondering how our finances were going to survive and what we're you know, going through and all, and this one stuck out to me, and I, I committed it to memory because it's God's promise of blessing on us if we honor him. Not name it and claim it, not get rich, but he takes care of us. So here's what it says. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, 
so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Ushers, would you come forward, please? There we go. Oh, Lord, we do thank you for all the good things you've given to us and for the privilege and pleasure that we have of giving back to you. Help us to do it cheerfully to your glory, to building up of your kingdom, and for our good. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. stand. Except for children who want to come up for children's time. If you would, I'd appreciate it. Here they come. <laughs> oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you give me a high five? Yay. <laughs> Can you give me a high five? Yeah. Yay. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. I don't know if little brother's coming up or not, but if he does, he's welcome. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever been in a situation where you got feeling really down, like somebody did something bad to you, or like I had a teacher in second grade. I'm pretty sure she didn't like me. <laughs> Probably started when I knocked over the Easter egg tree and broke a bunch of eggs. I'm not sure, but. I, I mean, she never said anything good about me or to me. <laughs> and one day, we did a craft project after lunch. And, you know, we all had little cartons of milk for lunch and our, our food. And, and I'd always crush my carton to throw it in the trash to save room, because that's what I was taught. And we came back in after recess, and everybody had a milk carton on their desk that we were going to use for this craft project, but mine was my crushed carton. There were plenty of other cartons, but she said, no, Dan, you always crush your carton, so that's what you get. <laughs> this, this little packet in here in this bottle is like my feelings when she said that. This is what happened to me. They just sank right down. I just felt terrible. Teacher doesn't like me. Well, I don't know if she really didn't like me or not, but, but it sure seemed that way to me. But you know, there's a lot of other things going on in my life that were good. I belonged to church, and we had a good time in Sunday school, and the teachers there loved me and took care of me, and God loves me and took care of me. And when I started thinking about those things, what my teacher thought of me and what she did really didn't bother me that much after all. And now that's a very distant memory. <laughs> I dig up now and then to make a point here in church maybe. But I don't know what kind of things you're going to run into in life. But when, when things happen that get you feeling down, maybe an argument with friends or a fight, or maybe mom and dad are being extra strict, it seems. Just remember, 
They love you, and God loves you. Your church friends love you, and your spirits will come up. Don't let them get you down. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us family, family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, whether we're here by ourselves or with the gang. And Lord, you love us above all. You, have the, you are the friend that sticks closer than a brother. You are always with us through whatever we go through in life. And you give us encouragement and joy. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thanks for coming up. Yeah, second grade eventually ended. <laughs> I had some really good teachers along the way, too. I figured out teachers are people, too. When you're a little kid, you don't always understand that, but they're people, too, and they have life, life issues and things that are going on. And, and I know we have teachers here in church, and they're, they're definitely real people, too. So <laughs> we encourage you in what you do and the ministry you all do. Well, today's message is uh, sort of a continuation of the Christmas message. A lot of times you get this around Christmas time, but we don't know exactly when this happened. In the manger scene that was down here through last week, you have the baby Jesus in the manger and Mary and Joseph and the animals and the shepherds and the wise men. I think the wise men were here. Usually they are. They probably weren't there or at the manger when Jesus was in, in the manger. It was probably a while after that, six months or even a year after. We don't really know, but it is part of how we remember his coming and a very important part of it. So that's what we're going to read about today and then what happened after the wise men left. So that's Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. Matthew 2, 13 to 18, if you would stand it's on the screen as well as in your pew Bibles. If you'd stand as I read, I'd appreciate it. I think it's on the screen. It's not on the screen. Okay, it's in your pew Bibles. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, where, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. You may be seated. <clears throat> you know, one of the main points of this message that I want to get across today is obedience when God tells us to do something to do it and don't delay there was a farmer that had an old mule and it was kind of a stubborn mule and didn't always want to do what he told him to do I guess mules are famous for that my father had one he he shares how the mule just wouldn't do what he wanted him to do so he decided to sell the mule and he advertised and another farmer came and you know was talking to him and after a while the point the case of the mule came up and so the other farmer said well does the mule work hard? And the farmer selling it said, yeah, he puts in a hard day's work. And the other farmer said, well, does he listen? Does he obey you and do what you tell him? And he said, yeah, he does. And so, okay. So they went out and they hooked it up to a little wagon and you know they were gonna have him pull the wagon to show how well he listened. And the farmer that was thinking of buying said, all right, giddy up. And the mule just stood there, didn't do anything. So the farmer that was selling it picked up a two-by-four and walked around in front of the mule and just stared at him for a minute, and then he just whacked him really hard with the two-by-four. And then he said to the other farmer, now try it. And the guy's giddy up, and the mule took off. He said, yeah, he obeys, but you have to get his attention first. 
Well, that's kind of like us and God. I mean, we are to obey God. And it tells us in Psalms chapter 32, don't be like the horse or the mule without understanding, which must be curbed by bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. God says, I want to guide you and direct you, but we need to pay attention and obey him. So the first point that we're going to talk about is when God tells you to do something, obey immediately like Joseph did, because to delay is to disobey. Second point, God's kingdom is made up of those who are in Jesus, not necessarily those who are racially Jewish. God's not finished with Jewish people, but being Jewish is not a precondition to be saved. And then thirdly, weeping in Rama that this passage talked about is because of loss of life. But death is not the last word. God has the last word, and he saves the young boys who were killed there in Rama, and he can do the same in our lives. So just before this passage, we read last two weeks ago when, we, when I preached on this before about the wise men, how they had come and they found baby Jesus and they bowed down and they worshiped him and gave gifts to him. And then it says they were warned in a dream to go back a different way and not to go to Herod and tell Herod where baby Jesus was. Now, my thinking is how long do you suppose they were there before that night they had the dream? And I thought of, you know, growing up when relatives would come and visit or when we visited, we would usually stay a few days, you know, to make the trip worthwhile. So I imagined them on the third or fourth night, fifth night, whatever, the angel comes and says, go a different way. But actually, it may have been the very first night that they were there. The Bible doesn't say real clearly. It just says they came, they bowed down, they worshiped, they were warned in a dream to go another way home. A lot of commentators think it was the same night. Um, they woke up in the middle of the night and they left then in the middle of the night. And that makes sense because Bethlehem is only about six miles from Jerusalem where Herod was. So Herod had sent them from Jerusalem to, he knew they were going to Bethlehem, didn't know where, but somewhere in Bethlehem. And he said, come back and tell me. And he probably realized that they weren't coming back. And so as they were having that dream and the angel was warning them, there may have been soldiers riding on the road coming toward Bethlehem. It says in verse 13 then, when they had gone, maybe in the middle of the night, then the angel came to Joseph. So like there were two events that night. The wise men were warned to leave by another route and they did. They got up and left. And then after they left, the angel came to Joseph and the angel warned him too that he had to leave. Get out, Herod's soldiers are coming. So Joseph got up right away, and it says he left in the night. He and baby Jesus and Mary headed for Egypt. Joseph left the same night that he had the dream from God. It wasn't a recommendation from God that says, well, Joseph, you really should think about going down to Egypt sometime. It's a better place for you, better health, better for your health, better environment. No, it was get out now, and Joseph obeyed right away. For us, sometimes we're waiting for things to happen. Sometimes we're praying for things to happen. And it takes a long time for the fullness of time to develop. But then when they do begin to happen, they happen quickly. And obedience must be quick as well. Delayed obedience is disobedience. This is a lot different than another time an angel warned some people to get moving because death was coming. If you remember back in the Old Testament, Lot and his wife and daughters were staying in a city called Sodom. And it was a wicked city along with Gomorrah. And God had decided he'd talk to Abraham about it. And he was going to bring judgment on these cities and destroy them. And so because of Abraham's faith, two angels went down to Lot in the evening before the destruction. And they said, Lot, you got to get out of here. God is going to destroy this city. And Lot said, oh, oh, okay. Well, let me go ask my son-in-laws and see if they want to come along too. So he went and talked to his son-in-laws and he said, hey, this city's going to be destroyed. We've got to get out of here. And the son-in-laws laughed at him. They didn't believe him. So he went back home and he said, yeah, they're not coming. 
The angels are like, let's go. He dilly dallied. This was in the evening. It was getting morning, and Lot was still at home and had not made any move to leave. And finally, the angels grabbed him by his coat and his wife and his daughters and dragged him out of the house and took him out on the road and headed him away from Sodom to save their lives. If they hadn't done it, who knows what would have happened, what would have happened to Lot. Even so, as they were going down the road, it tells us that Lot's wife turned around to look back because she really didn't want to leave her home behind. And she turned to a pillar of salt and was still standing there as a pillar of salt looking at the city. So, delayed obedience is non-obedience. When God says, go, go. When God says, do something, do it. When God says, don't do something, don't do it. When God says, begin something, begin it. Joseph and Mary and Jesus were gone when the soldiers came. The soldiers missed them. That was good. They obeyed. But there was more going on than just them escaping with their lives. There was a point for them going down to Egypt. That was part of God's plan, too. It looks like it's sort of coincidental, Herod sending soldiers, oh, you better get out, go to Egypt. But that was written in the Old Testament hundreds and hundreds of years before it occurred. Because Matthew then points to Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1, where Hosea wrote, Out of Egypt I called my son. And the context of Hosea there is he was talking about how God brought Israel out of Egypt. And Israel was called God's son, the people of Israel. Maybe, we don't know exactly how many, many, but maybe a million people or so left Egypt. Divine miracles happened and Pharaoh released them. And God then made a covenant with them and said, you will be my people, obey my commands and I will bless you. That's what it was talking about. But this prophecy also points forward to the time of Jesus. Parallels in the history of Israel and in the life of Jesus are not by accident. They're by God's design so that we can look back at them and see, ah, this is really true. From thousands of years before, God had this plan he was going to accomplish, and we could all see it. Now, the Old Testament makes it very clear that the nation of Israel... Abraham's descendants through Jacob were God's special chosen people. He selected them out of all the other peoples of the earth and said, you are mine, I will make a special covenant with you. This doesn't mean that other people couldn't come to God. They could seek after God, and a lot of them did, and maybe even joined in with Israel and took the, the rites and became Jewish in religion. Um, but they were the ones that God chose, the Jewish people. And God brought them out of captivity in Egypt. And now Jesus returned from Egypt. And Matthew's gospel points that out, proving that Jesus is the chosen one. So you have a switch. There was God's chosen people, Israel, coming out of Egypt. Now you've got God's chosen one, Jesus, coming out of Egypt. And it shows that our place in the kingdom is no longer dependent on our racial identity. We don't have to be racially Jewish but we come to relationship with God through Jesus. If you are in Jesus, if you are a Christian, you are also one of God's chosen people. Yeah. Listen to this passage from Galatians. Chapter 3, verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. It's not just Abraham's literal descendants who are God's chosen people. It's believers in Jesus from all races. So, does that mean that Israel is no longer God's chosen people? God's like, yeah, I tried to work with you, but it didn't work out. I'm moving on. I'm going to you know, send Jesus and save the rest of the world. Is God done with them? Were they only branches that were cut off the trunk of salvation in God in order to make room for other people to be grafted in or is there more and yes there is more God is still working his plan with the nation and the people of Israel there's a passage a promise in Jeremiah 31 verses 35 through 36 I want to read it's kind of long so track with me if you can here this is what the Lord says 
He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and the stars to shine at night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. So he's identifying, this is me. I'm God, the creator of the earth. Then he says, only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will Israel ever cease being a nation before me. So what it's saying is, in other words, as long as there is day and night, Israel will be a nation before God. So we're still having day and night. Israel is still a nation before God. They do not always do God's commands. In fact, many people in Israel right now are far from the Lord, I would say. But they're still God's people. They may go into exile. They may suffer much. But they will always be God's chosen people. But the real point that I want to get across to us here, though, is regardless of our race, we are also included as God's chosen people with his special plan of salvation. Again, Galatians 3.29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Heirs means we inherit the promise of God, of life. If you are in Jesus, you are also part of God's family. It is no longer based on racial identity as Jewish. It is based on relationship with Jesus. Okay, I hope I haven't spent too long on that, but this is a really big thing that we need to understand. Israel is God's chosen people, and we also are God's chosen. Okay, one more thing to back it up. This is from the letter to Thessalonica that Paul wrote. And in Thessalonica, there were a lot of Jewish believers and a lot of non-Jewish believers, a lot of Gentiles. And so he was writing to both, both groups of people in the church. And this is what he said, For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Basically, if you believe the gospel and it has changed your life, you are chosen by God. This doesn't mean we need to go live in the Middle East, <laughs> but we are God's chosen child to live out wherever we are. Okay, the last thing I want to look at today is this tragedy of the slaying of the little boys. It's the part where Herod got angry, was furious because the wise men did not return, and ordered every child, every boy under the age of two to be killed in Bethlehem and the vicinity. Now, let me put it in context. Bethlehem was not that big of a place. Historians tell us that there were probably between 10 and 30 children, boys, who were under the age of two who were killed. And furthermore, not to say it's not a bad thing, it's definitely a bad thing, but Herod was known to be a tyrannical killer. He killed three of his own sons. He killed his favorite wife. He had ten wives, and there was one who was a favorite. He killed her. He killed her mother. He killed her mother's father. And he also killed several of his uncles and his cousins. Augustus said of Herod, he said, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. You see, they didn't eat pigs. And so a pig's chance of a long life was greater than being one of Herod's sons. So we might ask, why didn't God protect these innocent children? Jesus got away, but these children died. That, that's a shame. But when we think about that and, and we ask why, there are two things to consider. First, we are all born in sin and under the judgment of God. It's an inherited sin that we have. Now, we think of sin as the things that we do, but it's because of the sin that is inborn in us, the sin nature that we have that causes us to do the things that we do. And so everyone is guilty before God, even these little boys that were two years old and younger. That's one thing to remember. But the other thing to remember, and it's a very comforting thing, is that God is merciful, and we believe that when a child dies, God does not hold the sin against him or her. The child has not reached the age of accountability, as we say, the age where they're able to make a choice to follow God or to reject God. They have not developed moral understanding to the point where they can respond to God. And so the child is still saved, 
but he's saved through the death of Jesus, just like we are. Because everybody who is saved is saved through the death of Jesus, right? It says that clearly in Acts. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which, by which we must be saved other than Jesus. So it's only through Jesus. You can't be saved by following Buddha or by following one of the Hindu beliefs or anything else. Only by Jesus. Okay, Jesus wasn't around in the Old Testament. And a lot of the times they didn't even know about Jesus. Like the heroes of the faith, Abraham and Moses and Elijah and King David, Samuel and Daniel and the other prophets. They didn't know about Jesus. They only followed God with the light that they had at that time. So are they saved? Because it's only through Jesus that you can be saved. Yes, they are. They are saved through Christ's grace because it was determined before the foundation of the world that he would come and sacrifice his life. So even though they didn't know the name of Jesus, as they responded to God in the light that they had, it was Christ's sacrifice that made them righteous, that made them right before God. And it's that same sacrifice of Christ that makes a child that isn't of the age to understand right with him. It takes away his guilt. In a sense, those little ones who were killed there in Bethlehem died for the sake of Jesus. And so, in a sense, they were the first martyrs. I think in the Catholic Church, they honor them in a special way. We don't necessarily do that. But we acknowledge that they were killed for the sake of Christ. And because we believe that Christ's grace carries through to them, even though they were too young to understand, they are in heaven with God now. They gave up their lives for Jesus. Whatever they gave up, dying so young, they missed out on a lot of things. But it does not compare to the joy and the glory that they now have with God in heaven. So this is a situation where God has taken something that is terrible and made it into something good. From our perspective here on earth, it just seems bad, evil, and unfair that these children would be killed in this way. And that's true, it is. But it also has a spiritual, heavenly result that is beyond compare. So the takeaways today are these, three things. When God tells you to do something, either directly through his word, or through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, or perhaps someone who gives you good Christian counsel and you, you trust them and you, you sense that the Spirit is speaking through them. When he tells you to do something, do it. To delay is to disobey. Secondly, if you have believed the gospel of Jesus and prayed to receive him as your Savior, you will see a difference in your life. Rejoice, for you are a child of God, chosen and loved by him. And then thirdly, when bad things happen, and it is hard to see how it could possibly be for good. Trust in God. This life is not the end all. For the Christian, this life is actually just the beginning. So as, receive, as we receive communion today, let's think about these things that God has done for us and thank Jesus for that. Communion reminds us of how much Jesus loved us, that he would give his life for us. And it also reminds us that we are one in him. We are his body here on earth. Now, it's symbolic, the juice and the bread. That's all they are, juice and bread. But when we pray over them, we consecrate them, and we take them in, in a spiritual sense, we are communing with God. Jesus said, unless you... Eat my flesh, which is bread, you cannot have eternal life. Now, he didn't say literally to eat his flesh, but he was speaking in a spiritual sense, and that's what we do when we take communion. And so we don't do it lightly. We do it very seriously and thoughtfully. And um, before we go and receive communion, we come before Christ, and we open our hearts, and if there's anything that is not right, if there are some things that are going on that we need to confess, 
we take time and confess them before Christ and ask for his forgiveness. Our table is open. Anyone who has received Christ is welcome to join in. I will pray a prayer of confession. It's a, it's a prayer that came down to us through the Anglican Church. Um, it sounds a little bit formal, but it says it pretty well. And after that, we'll take a few moments and we'll just pray silently anything that is on your heart. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned. We have sinned against you, your holiness, and your love. And we deserve only your anger and punishment. We sincerely repent. We are genuinely sorry for all the wrongdoing and every failure to do the things we should. Our hearts are grieved, and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now each of you take a few moments and pray in your heart. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we'll pray for the consecration of the bread and the juice. Merciful Father, we are following the command of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we receive this bread and this cup. As, as we do this, remembering his suffering and death for us, help us to partake of his body and blood. In the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Servers, would you come forward now? We will... Pass out the elements, we'll pass out the bread, and after you've received it, please hang on for a few moments and we'll all partake together. Please come.
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. We'll now distribute the cups, and again, please hang on them to them until all have received. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful.
Oh, Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much for what you've done for us. Thank you for the peace that it brings to us, knowing that we are saved by you, not by anything that we do, but by trusting in you. And then you work in us. Glory, hallelujah. Praise your name. Amen. last hymn today, and that is in uh, th- uh, here, hymnals in uh, 371. So, stand with me, it's great you were here today. Stand with me and sing, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.